icebreaker question. Uh, then when we start with questions for the actual forum, you will have one and a half minutes to answer. Everyone is allowed two red cards. Uh -huh. So the red card is worth a minute and a half. You can use it any way you want. You can rebut somebody. Um, you can add it to the time that you want to use to answer a question. You can bring something up that maybe hasn't been discussed. Um, let's see. And then at the very end, you'll have a minute to sum up. And we're going to start with um, Toby. He's going to give you the icebreaker question. And I'm assuming that the mic is down there, so we'll start with Tim. All right. This is something I've always dreamed of to have personally happen to me. So, um, if you had to pick a walkout song like baseball players have for your debates and forums, what would it be? I'm sorry, I missed the whole question. <laughs> if you had to pick a walkout song like baseball players have for your debates and forums, what would it be? I think it plays when you're walking out. It's like your theme song. A so, walkout theme? Like, <laughs> As you're walking out, as you're walking out to your debate or your forum, like tonight, and you had one song to play as your soundtrack, what would it be? And I got one minute to. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll just sit in silence for 45 seconds. Um, interesting question. Uh, <laughs> any anyone in the audience like to help me? <laughs> Um, I don't know, honestly. I don't. I don't have a. I don't have a song that comes to mind. Yeah. Sorry about that. Oh, I don't need it. Uh, <laughs> but it, it would not be a funeral dirge uh, because on on balance, St. John's is in a great position. I mean, we have made tremendous strides in improving the quality of services, and that has enabled us to uh, attract people to our services and improve our financial position. Uh, all that said, uh, there's there's some excitement ahead of us uh, because... Uh, so I will close in five minutes. If you have any items to check out, please do so now. Thank you. We, we are confronting a, a crisis on the financial side in that the level of reimbursements that we get from Medicare, Medicaid, and even the private insurers is simply not sufficient for us to pay compensation that enables our staff to live in Teton County or even over the hill in Idaho. So we have an urgent need that's something I, I hope we can speak to further. So as I said, my walk-on theme would not be a funeral dirge, but we still have some serious problems. Um, I was asked to remind everyone to hold the microphone nice and close mm -hmm. so that we can pick up all the sound. Mm -hmm. All the sound. Thank you. And thank you all for being so interested in the hospital board that you are here tonight. My um, walk-on song in the baseball, I guess it would be, put me in coach. But if I were just thinking about my own theme song, I guess I'd have to say, um, The Hard Way by Mary Chick McCarthy. <laughs> Thank you. I think it definitely would be Edgar's Away. <laughs> and it's really kind of a synonym for what needs to be done in healthcare. We need to remodify what we're doing and think out of the box because what Mike said is right, that reimbursement's going down, doesn't mean we're gonna to have to reduce services. It means we have to think about being more clever. I'm Shannon Brennan and my walk-on song I at first thought was going to be born to be wild because I'm a horrible type A, and with age it's not getting any better. But I really had to think about it, and it would be Saturday in the Park by Chicago. 
because it, that song reflects happiness and enjoying the good times and taking advantage of the parks, if you will. And I, I've lived long enough to know that health is a real valuable thing. If you don't have health, if you're not healthy, happy, strong, you're not going to be able to enjoy those, those moments in the park. And I don't mean just Teton Park either. So I really think that that boils down to, with regard to St. John's Health, uh, it's a focus point for us. Largest employer in the county, perhaps, or right up there. And very, very central to all of our future, the health, however, however they deliver it. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the League of Women's Voters for hosting us tonight. Thank you. Uh, try to answer your question. I'm not sure exactly what song I would pick, but having grown up in the 70s, I'd probably pick a rock and roll band. <laughs> the Allman Brothers or The Doors or a great singer like Janis Joplin. Uh, people with soul. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak here tonight, and uh, my mission is to try to help St. John's be a great institution. I think it's a great institution today. It has a lot of potential, and there's a lot of work to be done to protect St. John's and build it in the future. Hi, I'm Dr. Pam Cutler, and I'm grateful to be towards the end of the line where I have a lot of time to think about all the songs. <laughs> and um, I, uh, my personal song would be uh, uh, the Beatles, um, Here Comes the Sun, and it doesn't necessarily refer to me, it refers to the light that we all want to bring to the world. And if I were to pick a song for all of us, who uh, some of you have been able to come up with a quick one, I'd say Born to Run by Bruce Springsteen. Hi, I'm Brent Blue, and uh, thank you all for coming. I know it's uh, a lot to give up an evening like this. Uh, I'm not a music guy, but I would, I would probably say Back to the Future, or whatever that theme song is. Uh, because I think that uh, St. John's does have a good future, but it, uh, there are a lot of serious problems to task, and these problems need to be addressed transparently. And I think it's going to be real important for the community to stand by the hospital uh, as we approach some of these really serious problems. Okay, uh, thanks all for indulging us on a silly question, but many of you alluded to several problems or challenges to address, so let's just dive into those. What do you see as the biggest challenges facing St. John's, and how would you how do you plan to address them if elected to the board? Well, I think I alluded to it a moment ago. I, I think the challenge of turning St. John's is uh, attracting and retaining outstanding staff. Uh, the quality improvements, the financial results uh, are attributable to the confidence and the caring of our staff. And they can't afford to live here anymore. And so I, I see the critical challenge confronting St. John's and the community, as it is a community problem, is raising the funding to provide staff housing. As I, as I suggested, we cannot possibly uh, raise compensation enough for them to compete for open market housing, and therefore we have to, we have to provide some solutions, and that will require uh, support from the community, uh, both in the form of spent uh, support for proposals like our proposal for uh, repurposing our land across from the hospital and making uh, much more dense housing available there. And uh, the community has provided that kind of support, both the voters and the philanthropic community. So I am, I am optimistic that we'll find a way to beat that challenge. Well, I totally agree that um, keeping, retaining, recruiting staff is the biggest challenge right now for the hospital. The, and I think it was in 2020, we still had about 16% of the staff turnover every year. In a recent housing survey that we did, 50% of the staff said they would leave because of housing. 
This is compared to other hospitals around the nation where people, when they say they're leaving, leave because they didn't like their administrator, they, they're leaving because they didn't like working conditions. People at St. John's love working there, but they can't afford to live in Teton County. So we have to realize that housing is health care and that we have to get serious about what we're doing about housing, which is why we have so many plans to address that. But it really is going to be going forward and for, unfortunately, many years to come, probably the number one problem that we have at Teaching County. There's no question that housing is a huge issue for the re issue of retention of staff. But it's more than just housing. It's the way staff is treated, the way they feel about their institution. And that means that the leadership of the institution must pay great attention to that over a long period of time. I am certainly for the development of housing. Um, more interested in us doing some community partnerships. I'm concerned that the hospital is trying to do it by itself. And I think that there are other places in the community that are delivering health services, for instance, the senior center, who can't do what the hospital does, don't have the resources. And I would really hope that the hospital would reach out and work more effectively with the other agencies in the community. Without the workforce at St. John's, there would be no health care. And I think it's important to recognize that at any moment, any event could transpire that could cause people to leave. Uh, you name it. What is it that creates an unstable workforce? Is it money? Is it uh, COVID? Is it uh, dissent within the ranks? Is it housing? Uh, many of these things could be triggers at any time for us to find that we have mass movement of people. It happens in many, many organizations. I'm concerned about staffing. And along with that, you can't detach this, is the housing issue. Along with that is not just do we give our power, do we, do we recruit people by saying, hey, you can have access to housing and rental, and you can pay $1,500 for a, a small unit. What about the doctors who come here what about the nurse practitioners and people who put a lot of money into their educations and they want to settle down? They want to stop moving and they'd like to live here. My concern is long-term housing. 100% behind the step here as far as building those rentals. But we need to look at some kind of scholarship, a mortgage scholarship program. Something similar to what uh, Dr. Hochheiser here was saying about more community engagement. Perhaps there are resources out there that could build to a foundation or foundation resources. They could put together long-term investments for scholarship, performance-based uh, awards to people who want to live here and want to engage 5, 10, 15 years down the road and actually buy a house. One more thought is I hope that the stabilization of the senior leadership takes place. Kudos to the current board for in place the CEO. I know for a fact firsthand, our, our people at St. John's are desperate for that stability. Well, I would agree that the uh, housing is a major issue if you were to list one single issue. Uh, but it's part of a bigger picture. Uh, but just to think on housing, People are concerned, what are we trying to do with hitching posts? It's 100 units. The hospital has done studies showing that there are probably 300 plus units. It's about half of the workforce of the hospital is going to need housing. So the project to build the hitching, hitching posts and King and Carms, they're making a, a real dent in it, but we're going to be battling this for years to come. We're going to need solutions for uh, physicians when we try to attack, attract physicians into the valley, they're going to need help buying a home. Uh, when you think about the broader issue of employee satisfaction, I think the new leadership that we helped bring in, and Jeff Salas, our new CEO, it's an important issue and challenge to make sure he onboards successfully. And one of the great things about this new leader is he's focused on culture at the hospital, 
and making sure that we have the right attitude among our workforce to make quality a priority, but also to prioritize uh, team efforts among the staff and employee retention. I, I would say staffing is our number one problem, and housing comes under that. The other things that I would, because maintaining staffing in a time of tough economics, poor housing, and burnout being a high problem is really a challenge in healthcare across the country. Um, I think the things that we need to do certainly are to address housing, and I won't berate that because I think we're all on the same page about that, and most of us are. Um, we also, we just made really good steps in improving the pay. Um, those are key things. But the, the thing that I personally think gets overlooked somewhat in the staffing concern is that people want to come to work. You know, people go into healthcare and they want to come to work at a place that gives really good quality healthcare. And we have excellent quality healthcare, but I've done a lot of work in quality in the past. And the hardest thing you can do is like maintain the position that you're at. And I think that's the, pro if we focus on that, that would be one of the things that will help us maintain our staffing because people will want to work here and it will continue to be a great place to work, a great place to give care. Well, I, I think there's some serious problems we have. I think the board is, is not tuned into the hospital staff and they're not tuned into the community. I mean, we have significant problems with the hospital work environment at the hospital. Uh, there are issues of sexual harassment that aren't dealt with appropriately. And you're not going to, no matter how much you pay people or give them a place to live, they're not going to stick around in a, in a setting like that at St. John's. That has to be dealt with and it has to be dealt with appropriately. Hopefully this new CEO will do that, but the board has to be on, on uh, uh, board for that. Uh, in addition, uh, as far as the housing issue, housing's a problem all over this county. If we're going to build a $100 million facility uh, to house people, uh, I'm not sure that's the solution. Uh, it might be, a, I don't know if you're gonna keep people for more than two or three years in an apartment. They're gonna wanna live in a home. And maybe the better thing to do would be taking the interest on $100 million to give people a $10,000 uh, a year bonus uh, for retention, which is what you get on the interest on that kind of money. Uh, we have to be creative in keeping people around, but we have to improve the work environment at the hospital. Can you send it all the way back down to Tim? Uh, thank you. Uh, the biggest issue facing the hospital this time is not housing. It's the current board. Housing isn't a problem. Housing is a symptom of a problem, and that problem has been the absolute aggregation of the board's duty over the last decade or more to do anything about it, to address it in any way. It's the largest employer in the county, I guess debatably with a resort. It grosses $150 million a year, and yet it's done nothing. And let me clarify nothing. The other day I heard uh, that the, the hospital says we have 100 units. But in fact, they have not developed or built a single unit. And that matters. They've been competing with the public for units. You can't say that's providing housing because it's pilfering from the rest of the community. In the meantime, they've created, it's hard to tell, it's hard to get the figures on it, um, 100 to 150 jobs ooh, uh, uh, in the last 10 years. I met with, uh, with Lou in 2015. Um, and I tried to encourage him to do something about housing. He had identified housing as the number one, quote, future problem of the hospital was housing, and yet did nothing, and the board did nothing. Nothing is not an acceptable alternative to a calamity. Now, some of us will get under our desks, and some of us will stand on top of our desks, but doing nothing was not an acceptable response over the last decade. Thank you. Uh, before Miranda asks her question, I'm going to remind you that you have two red cards, and they're good for a minute and a half. So if you want to expound, you can always hold up a red card and add a minute and a half. Oh, at, 
at that moment, right? Anytime you want. No, I'm going to say that. Uh, hello. Uh, so, is the Board of Trustees representative of our community? Uh, what kinds of people should be on it? What about the Board of Advisors? What kinds of people should be on that board? Thank you for that question. I think that our Board of Trustees should be representative of our community as best as we can given the governance model that we have to run for election on the Board of Trustees. Something like a nonprofit where you can select the people that you would like to have on your board because you have certain needs. We need a lawyer. We need somebody who knows something about running a hospital. Um, we don't have that luxury in that same way. However, we do have a board of advisors that we can choose so that we can get the resources that we need in order to be able to do our jobs effectively. Our board right now is probably the strongest that it has ever been in all the decades that St. John's has been in business. We have people who know about the community. We know we have people who know about medical care. We have Evan who knows about running hospitals. We have Mike who's been on the board for a very long time. We're in a very strong position. We've just hired an incredible CEO. And we're looking forward to a very strong year ahead of us. Thank you. Well, I agree with Catherine that it's an unusual system of elections. The board has um, been able to appoint advisors. And by the way, I was the first advisor the board ever appointed. Um, it started a trend. Um, I think it was a good one. Um, but the board has tended not to look at the community and say, how do we make our board representative? The board has chosen people within their own image, very good people, I'm not denying that. People who work very hard, and they agree that the board is good. But in terms of being representative, it's not. The advisors are not representative. Um, and it's not an easy task. So I'm not saying you just wave your magic wand and get the right people in. But I think the board really has to work much harder and works. It fills in with the issue of transparency, where there's not as much transparency about the board's decisions to have the community understand why they made decisions. And just if you look at the number of people from the community that attend the board meetings, it's very few, if any, a lot of times. And that just means that there's not things that interest the community that are going on in the actual board meetings. The decisions are made in committee and then brought to the board meeting as a done deal. I'm not sure that the uh, concept of mentors, or rather advisors, to the board is something that's within the board charter. I don't know, is it? Mm -hmm. It is. It's a convention that I think works really, really well where you have a management board and you want to have understudies, if you will. People who will be able to move in to positions and be technically adept or adept uh, in terms of decision making or things like that. But the problem is that this isn't a management board. This is a board of trustees. It's a public board. It's a public hospital. And so, yes, I think that Teton County has benefited from the wisdom of a lot of very, very educated and very experienced people, particularly from the corporate world, and very networked people. But it is a public board, so access to it is important. Awareness by the community of the incredible amounts of money that are being spent here important to the community. 
So I would say that there's a great opportunity to look again at this type of board and say, why is there no or such small, uh, limited public engagement? That's why I threw my hat in the ring. My background is government. My background is public stakeholder involvement, community engagement. And I would really like to see a whole lot more awareness by people in Jackson and Teton County about this hospital. It's a great place to work, brings in a lot of money, and it's a great ambassador for the tourist industry. And I will stop now. <laughs> Well, I would just add here that running a hospital is serious and complex business. And we shouldn't underestimate the skill sets that are necessary to do that. And I also think the diversity of talents to do it. So as uh, Catherine mentioned, I think there are a lot of great talents uh, both running for the board here, but also on the existing board. Uh, when I look at it, for myself personally, I had experience in Washington, D.C. at Children's National, large hospital system and learn how really well-run hospitals are run from the board governance perspective. I think that's very important to have that kind of experience because there are a lot of tough decisions, but also there's process to running a hospital and especially a dis public district hospital. And I guess I would take a moment and come back at my colleagues here and say, I think that the hospitals made some great progress in, the, in bringing on advisors I participated in that process last fall. It was a very open, transparent process. Brought in a lot of good people into leadership of the hospital. There's clearly opportunities to do more. And examples of doing more are to try to change how we run our meetings and how we interact with the community. Some of my ideas are to have more town halls. Apparently, this used to happen where uh, important matters were brought to the public. They weren't just decided by board members, but in fact they were decided through a process that engaged the community. I think that's something that would help change the perception of how the board functions. I also, um, yeah, all these things that would get community input, I think, will make a big difference in perception of the board. Does he get to put his red card on now? I'd like to share with you one of my experiences, and that is after four and a half years as the CEO of the hospital, after three years as an advisor, I was shocked about what I learned about the hospital when I became a consumer and part of the structure of some of the other not-for-profits. I was surprised at how the other not-for-profits felt about the hospital, the lack of interaction, the lack of um, support. Uh, if you take seniors and you start to talk about home care, we're sad in this community about home care. We do not have an adequate home care program, and the hospital and the senior center ought to be working together, and they're not. So there's a lot of things that are not going on that aren't, weren't apparent to me when I was part of the inner, inner structure that are apparent now. We need to change what we're doing in mental health and behavioral health. We need to change what we're doing with seniors. And we need to change how we're approaching the community. So the question, if I remember correctly, was, is the hospital board representative and is the department advisor representative? And um, while I think the board has a great group of people currently, I think it needs more representative people who have medical experience. I don't think that it should be all people with medical experience, but I, I look at my background of having been an emergency physician for 25 years practicing, and I have many, many more years with great emphasis in rural medicine, EMS, quality and safety, hospital leadership, and running businesses that actually provide care to people, running them and making sure they're financially viable. I think you need people with that kind of experience on the board, along with another variety. That said, it's an elected board. It's the people who get to decide that. So I think the opportunity that the board should take, which they have done, is to bring people with skills that they lack, uh, 
from the elected people and have their advisors fill those roles. The one other void that I think this organization has is that um, we see many other organizations that I have worked with around the country. There's been a trend in recent times that you would have a public representative who's actually a voting member of the board who is a patient and represents the patient point of view, not just the political point of view or the finance point of view, someone who really represents the patient. And, and so you want a patient or a patient's family member who's had experience. And I personally have been on boards in healthcare. I'm going to get made to stop, so I'll pull my little red card here. Um, I have personally been on organizations that have had that sort of a representative and have seen them bring value to boards where they really tell us things that we're not seeing because we are coming from a completely different perspective. As, and, and they need to be represented. So that would be a, a change that I would like to see happen. And while we can't force the, the public to, to elect the people we want, we could use that as an advisory capacity. I think it would be an excellent change to add to the board. I, I think the short answer to the question of, as to whether the board is representative of the uh, community, and it's an absolute no. Um, I mean, I, I've been here for 40 years when I started here. Uh, there were 12 doctors on the board, uh, and I mean 12 doctors on the staff, and all the board members were long-term locals, year-round locals, and that made a huge difference. And they all used the hospital as well. Uh, I think the this advisor system, uh, quite honestly, if you have a, a, a board of trustees, I'm not sure why they need advisors. They don't run the hospital. That's the CEO and the upper level staff from the hospital, and if they need advisors, that's where the advisors are needed, not, not with uh, the board. And there are major problems with the upper level staff and the C-suite at this hospital. There are major problems, and uh, they haven't been addressed. I think they were going to be addressed by the, the previous CEO, um, and uh, he uh, ended up losing his job over that issue. Uh, the the uh, there's so much going on here that the, 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 the hospital is not addressed. Mental health has been a big one. Uh, drug abuse has been a big one. Um, uh, and just to give you an example, uh, uh, I've been here long enough that where I helped Jane Ottman start home health. We started the seat, uh, car seat program for people. Uh, I recommended that we get the, the, the daycare going so staff could have daycare. And it was even important, I even tried to get it for 24 hours so the nighttime nurses could have daycare and wouldn't have to rely on, on the spouse to uh, take care of the kids. So I think it's real important to have locals on this board, year-round, long-term locals. Long pause. Thank you. Uh, the answer to the question is no. It couldn't be a representative board, and here's why. The hospital board has rigged the elections for the last decade. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this, but someone will step down in advance in their last year. They step down six months before the election. This allows the board to appoint uh, off the advisory committee, which is a hand-selected advisory You've not voted for anyone in the past 10 years. I defy anyone to tell me the last individual that was actually voted in from the public. It, doesn't, it hasn't existed for over a decade. So it's legal to step down and it's legal to appoint, but it's questionably illegal to have an arrangement by which they step down so they can appoint an advisory board member who is hand selected. So no, there's no possibility that this is representative of anything but what the board wants to happen. It is not right to usurp the voting rights of the public who actually own the hospital. It's not a playground for the elite. This has consequences. And, and they have not abided by uh, a legitimate system. The advisors are hand selected, and then they select from their hand selected advisors uh, in order to appoint like minded people who do not believe in transparency, do not believe that housing is important until it's a complete and utter panic. 
So no, there's no, no represent. How, how can they embark, one would want to know, on a hundred million dollar from zero, a hundred million dollar construction initiative without a single person on the board or on the advisory committee that has any experience whatsoever in those size projects and the, and the incredible complexity of, of, of socially engineering or avoiding socially engineering uh, housing for their employees. They have no skill set. They don't put anybody on the board. They don't take housing seriously. Because if they did, there would be some advisors that had some experience in that. I was told recently by Jim Hunt, who's on the advisory committee, he said, yes, we self-select. That's a quote. Yes, we self-select. And this was in response to my saying, you guys have been stacking the vote uh, for a decade. He said, yeah, of course, we self-select. This is questionably even legal. It's certainly not ethical. And it isn't in the spirit of the community who owns the hospital. We own it. You folks own this hospital. They do not own it. They need more transparency, and they need a better representation from the public. Thank you. I'll raise my card just to defend the hospital. I can go. Uh, so before I came here to Jackson Hole, which was before the pandemic, I was involved with Children's National in Washington, D.C. They're great uh, not-for-profit hospitals all over the country. They're wonderful models for looking at how do you learn from best practice and implement it in a place like Jackson Hole. And best practice in not-for-profit healthcare systems all over the United States is that people work there for a long period of time and gain experience about the institution so that they don't parachute in thinking they know everything about that hospital the day they arrive. And that's why, for instance, when I was involved with Children's, I spent years there before I moved up through the, the system, ultimately into vice chair of the board. And that's a benefit of this advisor system. And I participated in that process last fall. It was incredibly open and transparent. They advertised in the newspaper. They looked for qualified people. There's much more that can be done, but ultimately, what I think all of you, the voters, want to have is a hospital that works, that isn't going to run out of, you know, financially into trouble, which will be bad for all of us because it can result in the hospital getting privatized. And a privatized hospital in Jackson Hole would not be a good thing for us. So we should all keep our eye on the ball as we want to have quality health care, we want to keep St. John's where it is. And from a government governance perspective, I think you need to try to have thoughtful people with proven experience. And the process of recruiting these advisors, I think, helps you see people in action. Uh, in the case of Catherine and myself, we helped recruit the new CEO. You can look at the outcome there in the process and say, hmm, I think that was pretty well done. I'd like to build on Evan's point, but also make some other ones. Um, running a hospital, even a relatively small hospital like St. John's, is complicated. It's, in fact, it's extremely complicated. Moreover, I think the, the hospital here is a community asset, and we need people that are concerned about protecting the interests of the community. Uh, fortunately, we have had, over the years I've been associated with, with the institution, a lot of people volunteering to go through this process of election and uh, to volunteer as advisors. Uh, and I think the existing board, at any point in time, has made a point of trying to select advisors that can fill needs for hard analysis, sound thinking, and, and bring experience in running large and complex organizations. Uh, when I joined the board, there were uh, two physicians on the board. Uh, when Emmy Knobloch uh, uh, had to resign because of health, there, there was one, Bruce Hayes. Uh, I think in leaning toward the selection of Lou and then uh, 
Oh, pray, the CEOs, we gave a little extra weight to having somebody not on the board who was a physician and could bring those skills. But I will also point out another serious problem in dealing with the, the management and uh, being on the board. And, and that is that it's a hell of a lot of work. And it's very tough, as I learned when I tried to recruit people from the community with quite different backgrounds, it's very tough to get somebody from a community that holds one or two jobs and also uh, may have children at home. Uh, it's, it's therefore been difficult to find community input from across the spectrum. Uh, the members of the board uh, really have to be able to manage their own time. And I run my own business, I'm my own boss, so I can accommodate board meetings and committee meetings at uh, many different days of the week and sometimes running <coughs> into long days. But it's very difficult to diversify the representation of, uh, of our community and in board positions. Maybe we should do more in having community committees. Um, uh, and we do have some community members on some of the uh, individual board committees, but more could be done. Okay, Toby's gonna ask a question and maybe answer this first. All right. Based on feedback from St. John's Health employees, there is an ongoing feeling of disconnection between the clinical staff at St. John's and the Board of Trustees. Concerns around transparency of the board are at the forefront. What is your plan to bridge the gap between the board and the clinical staff? <coughs> How might you hold your fellow board members accountable when it comes to transparency with both the staff at St. John's and the community? It's your turn to go um, Transparency is a huge issue and one that takes a lot of effort to make happen. It's much easier to shut people out than it is to bring them into the fold. And so it takes a concerted effort to have transparency. And you can't have total transparency uh, as much as you may want to. Um, you cannot have transparency around um, people's jobs. You can't have transparency about uh, certain issues that come up within the organization. That said, the idea of having open discussions within the community about the plans. For instance, there's a lot of misunderstanding, if you will, about the plan for expanding um, housing. What actually is the plan of the hospital? We know that they're planning on changing the hitching post, but what is the overall plan? Is there on paper a plan that includes What's going to be for the next three to five years? And does this get discussed with the community? I think we need to make an effort, and we can make an effort. This is not something that can't be overcome. It's just is going to take the will to do that. And I would suggest that the board move in that direction. And I would, if I were on the board, be helping to I have a master's in public administration, hospital administration, and I had an eight-month residency at a medium-sized acute care hospital in Rapid City, South Dakota a number of years ago. The hospital was merging uh, with another hospital, and they were going from private to a public hospital. I learned a lot. And then due to the fact that I didn't want to, as a hospital administrator, move from place to place, I opted to use my geology background and go to work for another uh, entity, a federal government entity, where I learned the value of stakeholder involvement and community engagement in things such as hospital management and other civic things. 
in terms of community planning and emergency management. And when you ask people to join, they do come. That's where I think it's very important for this board to be very transparent to the degree possible. Good job so far on meetings, conducting meetings and sponsoring the Zoom meetings. I like that. Definitely, let's keep it up. But maybe in the meeting minutes, how about let's have some metrics instead of say the budget reflects an increase over last year. Let's see some numbers, that kind of thing. Um, also, personnel issues. I am very sensitive to that. My background, I also uh, was involved in managing uh, an organization of 350 very highly paid professionals and I was the HR leader at that point. I know about personnel issues, I know about conduct versus performance. And you know, you pay a CEO $700,000 a year to manage the hospital, and you can probably rely on him to handle some of those personnel issues. With regard to, I'm gonna use this, <laughs> please. <laughs> With regard to the board handling personnel issues that are rise a little bit higher, there could be more transparency. Yes, there is a point where labor relations does become an issue and the attorneys get involved, but let's, let's move that up a little higher because the community's trust level is all important. Hey, I, I'd like to take half of mine. Can I do half? <laughs> well, I'd like to start by saying transparency of the board is essential and of utmost importance. It's certainly something that I'm very committed to. Having been involved at the hospital for the last nine months, I've seen a lot of what the board's trying to do and also have some ideas about things we could do better. An example of what I think we did well was the recent CEO search. We went out, we, after we created a search committee, we reached out to some 30 stakeholders in the hospital about, uh, and also in the community to get feedback of what do you want in a new CEO. As we were getting to the finish line, we engaged some 20 members of the medical staff across the hospital to get feedback on what they thought of the different candidates. So um, it could be done. When you look forward, one of the things I aspire to be involved in is the strategic planning for the hospital. I think that's how we bring all of these issues together with the communities, to run open meetings on key topics where we get information about what's important for everyone. Is it elder care issues? Is it substance abuse issues? Are there lines of service that are important? That could be wrapped up into a strategic plan that the community embraces because that process involved everyone. And I think we can start there with strategic planning as Jeff Salas comes in as the new CEO. And then looking forward, in board meetings we can engage the public more in specific topics to tell them in advance. We're gonna talk about this topic in this specific meeting. It could be about housing, or you have a, a town hall on housing. But that's how to make sure we're transparent and getting everyone involved. We all know that openness breeds trust and lack of information causes fear. To increase transparency amongst the community, between the community and this board, um, I, I think we need more discussion of things in the open. And it's not really all that pleasant to have long discussing meetings in public forums um, for people who are busy and want to get back to whatever it was they were doing. But I think having situations where the public hears the board discuss in an open manner how they're making decisions will make the public trust us. Because I think the public knows that people make mistakes. You know, the board may make decisions that don't work out very well. And if, but if people watch that process happen and saw the board disagree in a healthy manner, they would be much more comfortable and willing to trust and go forward. Um, I, I think this board is an amazing board. And I know that people have some disagreements and concerns about things that happened in the last couple of years. But the truth is, uh, the quality of care this hospital gives is phenomenal. And when I talk to people, I've been out asking, my whole purpose as I decided to run for this position was to ask people how they think the hospital is doing. Across the board, everyone tells me it's so much better than it used to be. It's not perfect, but we will go forward. And I think finding ways to just engage the community more in our meetings and have more open discussions will be part of what helps that. Well, I, I find it interesting that the, uh, the board thinks they're involved. I, I will admit that 95% of the 
medic, or the uh, uh, staff at the hospital uh, can't name one board member, and the medical staff just probably can only name one or two. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know when the last time I saw a board member ever walking through the hospital or talking to the staff or asking questions, or uh, even when they bought my practice, that no board member ever walked through our facility and asked what they were doing there. Uh, the hospital hemorrhages money in different places that the board is, is totally unaware of. In fact, the idea that we need to have uh, meetings in order to determine what the community needs, the community did a health care assessment uh, three years ago when I was on the Board of Health, the entire community was involved, including St. John's, and those priorities were made, and the board should know those priorities already. They don't need to have more meetings to know that mental health is a serious problem in this community and is, was listed second to all the problems in this community. Mental health is a huge issue. I don't know if the board knows that they, they kind of pissed away uh, a rheumatologist who wanted to be here full time. I don't know if they know that we got a psychiatrist that was coming uh, and a cardiologist who had a home here, had a place to live, and they pissed that away. I mean, there have been some incredibly bad decisions made over the past few years, and, and if, if the board doesn't know about it, uh, that's a real problem. If they knew about it and didn't do anything, that's even a greater problem. The employees of the hospital don't believe that there's sufficient contact and familiarity and support from the board. It's a reflection of the cloistered way in which the board has conducted itself for a very long time. Now, they, these aren't spontaneous feelings that the employees get for no reason. The employees are not being treated well. There's huge turnover. We know the issues. Morale is very low. The board is not involved. They are cloistered in their meetings, and they are conducting business without openness. They're frequently and flagrantly in violation of the Wyoming Open Meetings. Uh, this is well known among the legal community. Um, um, and uh, I believe that the culture of the board informs the selection of the advisors, which then becomes a spiral. And in this case, it's a downward spiral of bad decisions, untimely decisions, inability to connect with the people um, you know, that, that work at the hospital. I, how do they feel when, when CEOs are accused of of, of sexual harassment and then are given million dollar uh, payoffs. And, and they say, well, we can't say anything about it. Yes, they can. They're misreading the law. This board has not responded to the issues. If they're right now wringing their hands, I see your red card and up it. Um, they're wringing their hands and blaming, in, in large part, what's wrong on housing, yet they've controlled it. For, for, for decades, they've had the ability to borrow and develop. They've had the willingness of the community and the, and, and, and the commissioners and, and, and the town council to aid them in this. This was a no-brainer, literally a no-brainer. And yet, they didn't care enough as recently as seven years ago, to do anything but order <laughs> another housing study and then proceed to do absolutely nothing. This board is systemically in failure. It needs a new culture. It doesn't see it because it's living it. It's like all of us. Our lives seem real because it's our life. But in fact, the trustees have not responded to the needs of the community, to the fact that the hospital is owned by the community. And, and they have not uh, been responsive to, to, to those uh, obligations that they have. This, this board needs a, a thorough cleaning. Thank you. I pick up on, on Evan's point about the opportunities to do better. 
Um, I think the, the Zoom meetings have been instructive. In the, for the first time, we've had more than two attendees to board meetings that are not hospital employees. Um, and it's encouraging. I, I kind of resist going back to in-person meetings after the COVID threat abates a bit, though our statistics this morning were not very encouraging on that score. And I rushed to get my fifth uh, vaccination last week. Uh, uh, so community participation can certainly help. Uh, that said, the hospital can't do everything in the community. We are very, very busy trying to deal with the, the physical health problems of our community. Uh, furthermore, the board can't and shouldn't try to do everything. Uh, the board function is to work on policy and hire the CEO that can implement those policies consistent with community needs in a highly cost-effective fashion. So it is not the board that's responsible for rounding every morning. It's not the board that's responsible for setting the details of compensation. We have uh, the HR committee uh, directed by the CEO coming back with recommendations. Those recommendations get discussed at the board level. Uh, but we don't implement the annual reviews or anything else like that. So I think uh, that some of the concerns being voiced tonight by some people have to do with the different roles between the board's role in setting policy and the CEO and the administrative team and the staff of the hospital executing on those policies. Having lived in Jackson Hole for over 30 years, I know the value of this community and the joy in involving the community. For 14 years, I was president of the Community Foundation where community was not only in our name, but in our hearts. Here at the hospital, we feel the same way. And in working with the hospital, I do hope to involve more of those nonprofits that I got to know so well in our day-to-day -day work. But the hospital has an unusual situation in that the mission of the hospital is confidential. The relationship between a patient and the provider is confidential. Yet the business of the hospital is public. So how, how we manage those things is, is complicated. And I think that we can do a better job I think we did an excellent job, actually, with our search. I spent a lot of time talking to staff. I spent many hours talking to the administrative team, finding out what people wanted in a new CEO. We were very transparent about the process of our search. We just could not reveal the names of the people that we were interviewing because they had jobs and their jobs may not have been, um, their employers may not have been as excited to hear that they were applying somewhere else. We shared with the public all of the steps we were taking. We shared with the staff all of the, where we were in the search process and we look forward to being able to go into the future with that kind of openness. I also think that there are opportunities for us on the board to be more involved in some of the day-to-day, -day, even though it's not exactly our role. It is a, uh, another way of engaging with the staff. And I'm going to be taking the um, healing touch training and becoming a volunteer for that soon. I think there are many ways that the trustees can interact with the community and we all look forward to continuing to expand our role and continuing to expand
those possibilities. Okay, um, I have half of the card. I'd like to rebut. <laughs> the hospital's mission is not classified. It is not classified. Classification and classified relates relates to national defense. Classification is not something that's protected when you talk about a community hospital. Every effort ought to be made, and if I get on this board, I would make every effort to ensure that every opportunity for open meetings, open information is made. If this were a private hospital, it would be different. Our taxpayer money is involved. We are the patients. Everybody in this room may have an opportunity to darken the door. It is not classified. I want to uh, move to some positives. Uh, one is I am hardened by most of what I'm hearing on this stage. First of all, some of the people are already on the board and are running for their positions. I'm hearing positives about behavioral health. I'm hearing positives about transparency. This board, this next board, will look very different than a board from two years ago. And that heartens me because I think the changes that we need are on the way. I also happen to know Jeff Sauls. I worked with him a little bit. I really I think the board did a fabulous job in choosing him. And I know his commitment is to community. His commitment is to people. And his commitment is to behavioral health. So hopefully, we're on our way. OK, I know it's getting a little late, but oh. Oh, you want to do closer statements? No, 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 I don't want to do closer statements. I was going to suggest we have one more question. But you want to use your No, I'll wait for the question. Are you sure? Yeah. Uh, so um, we're just conferring since we only have one question left. <laughs> All right, there's a lot of candidates up here tonight, and we hope with this question you can maybe help differentiate, differentiate yourselves um, a little bit. And I will also put myself out there a little bit in the hot seat. So for those of us who might not be as familiar with the operations of the hospital board, and I will include myself here, can you share your understanding of the board's duties and responsibilities and why you want to be a part of it and why you're the right person to be there. Sorry, yes. <laughs> My understanding of the St. John's Health uh, Board of Trustees is that it's a board of trustees. It is to oversee the not necessarily day-to-day -day activities of the hospital, but how closely the hospital's workings reach mission, among other things. And one of the problems I see is that there's a swim lane problem, a lack of clarity about the differentiation between the role of the CEO and the board. And this is really problemsome, because we need to know how much time it takes to be a board member. We need to know what is the value of a CEO. Is it $700,000 for a 120-bed hospital? Don't know. If you compare the rates of pay for different hospitals in the area or in the region or in the United, Western United States, how do we fare? Are we getting our money's worth? I think that the role of the trustees here at St. John's could be to watch over not just the mission, but to engage with the public and to look out and to create stronger relationships, not with just NGOs, but with people in general, small businesses, everybody in the community, everybody in the county, and then lead the work of the day-to-day -day operations to the CEO. That's what I'd like to see. If this were a management board, I would 100% be behind. Let's verify everybody's uh, uh, 
qualifications, their credentials, and let's do a very tiered mentoring approach, uh, but that is not the case. I get to go after you every time. You do. <laughs> I'll figure that out. <laughs> okay. Um, well, in terms of duties and responsibilities of the board, I've more than a minute and a half to answer. But I think, first of all, a duty of the board is to assure that the hospital is providing first class care. That can be done by supporting leadership of the hospital. So, one of the things boards do is recruit and um, support the CEO. That's critical because it's the CEO that actually runs the day to day operations of the hospital. And then I think as a trustee, it's essential to listen to people like yourselves, to listen to uh, the workforce of the hospital, and to try to, uh, in essence, in addition to all the framework, and there's a lot of legal framework to being a trustee, you need to uh, try to be a good steward of the institution. And I just wanted to quickly come back to the criticisms of employees and them being dissatisfied, uh, and the board not being in touch. Just in the last week, I spoke with the two uh, CNOs who both said they're very happy with the uh, pay changes that were made last summer. As they were uh, discussed with their staff, they were, me, some of them were using the word elated. They were so happy in them. We're coming out of the pandemic. It's easy to criticize the institution, but this was a tough time for healthcare nationally. And St. John's is doing well. And I think the job of a trustee is to have uh, the kind of temperament to help the institution be led into the future to support a CEO and, of course, to follow all the critical rules of engagement of being a, a trustee of the top hospital. Thank you. Um, so I, I think the purpose of the board, the job of the board, the duty of the board is to oversee the executive team and be responsible to the public for the management of that team. Um, it's not the day-to-day -day operations in this instance, as many people have said, that's very clear. They hire the executives, they, they review the things that are done, review the outcomes of patients, whether it's quality or financial um, outcomes, and then they ensure long-term viability of the organization and um, make decisions about that when necessary. As for my qualifications personally, I have been the CEO and the president of organizations that are all actively involved in direct healthcare delivery. I ran the Western Montana Clinic, which is the largest multi-specialty independent owned physician group in Montana. Um, I started a quality and safety program at a hospital system in New Mexico um, from the ground up where we made major changes and made sure that things were going very well. I was a senior leader in that hospital. I dealt with medical and legal issues and over, oversaw many of those things. I've hired and fired people from all levels, and I've served on boards, and I understand what boards do. And I believe all of those things give me lots of experience over 35 years um, that I can bring to this board and do a good job. Well, I, I, I certainly find it interesting that the, the board members are, that are coming on the board are congratulating themselves about hiring the new CEO. I really hope this new CEO is great, but it's the same board that had hired the previous CEO, so we have some things to prove. I mean, one of the major issues the board is responsible for is what is the mission of this hospital? Is this a community hospital or is this a referral hospital? Why, are, why did we buy a building in Lander and why are we running a clinic in Lander, Wyoming? It makes no sense for a community hospital like uh, St. John's to be running a facility like that. It has no real benefit for us. The, the number of referrals we would get in a situation like that is minimal. It's just not going to make any money. Are we, are we going to be a place where we're going to have uh, people from all over the surrounding area coming here for health care, for specialty health care? Are they going to go to Idaho Falls or are they going to go to Salt Lake? I mean, that's one of the major um, things that board has to decide. Are we a community hospital or are we a specialty referral hospital? And that's been a, a struggle over the years. I've been here long enough to know that, that uh, we have discussed this issue many times over. And it's very hard sometimes to get uh, specialty docs to come in here because there's not enough uh, work to do uh, here. For instance, uh, somebody once wanted to donate a cardiac cath lab. A cardiac cath lab, I'll go ahead and take that. 
a cardiac cath lab would be a great asset to the community. However, we don't have enough cardiac problems here to support the staff and maintain a level of proficiency that they need in order to have a cardiac cath lab. So that's the kind of thing a board needs to decide and needs to be aware of. Uh, I, I think that we have made some seriously bad decisions over the past few years, especially in where we've invested money, and there have been some critical mistakes. And I think that uh, I have seen this, I, I hate to say I know where the skeletons are, but I do, uh, and I know where the problems are around this hospital, and, and I encourage you to vote for me. I found it interesting tonight to hear how many times the <clears throat> current board members talked about running the hospital. Boards don't run hospitals. It's just a fundamental misunderstanding uh, of the guidance um, that a board is supposed to give. The person that runs the hospital is the CEO. The last four CEOs have been released, let's put it that way. In the last 11 years, there's been seven CEOs. It's, it, it gets really bad for morale. Um, I think that the board needs to cajole, it needs to lead, it needs to show leadership, it needs to involve itself. It, it, it needs to operate in a fashion that the employees think that the board is looking out for their interests and interested in them and what they do and how they do it. And there's no sign of employees at the hospital believing that that is what our board does. They don't run the hospital, and I don't want them to think they run the hospital. The hospital needs a great CEO, and the, the, the errors in hiring the last four have been astounding. And by the way, they were just as jazzed about the last three as they are about the new one. Fabulous, outstanding. But they don't flame out for six months to three years. So we don't have that kind of time increments to give away to a board that cannot resolve its own internal issues. Thank you very much. With respect to the role of the board, uh, we are elected representatives of the community. And as such, we try to deliver uh, what we think can be the best health care uh, to the community. Uh, we have interpreted uh, the mission to look out for the health of our community as being inconsistent with ownership by a larger outside organization, particularly one that's profit-centered. Uh, so we are in, in, in the business of trying to retain St. John's as an invaluable community asset. Uh, without the range of services provided by St. John's on a daily basis, many elective health considerations um, and, and treatments would be at best inconvenient, uh, even much more seriously without the 24 by 7 availability of emergency uh, services, uh, whether it's childbirth, trauma, cardiac, or other services, emergency help might be 90 or more miles away. Thus, protecting our vital community hospital uh, is critically important and really is the mission of the board. Uh, selection of the CEO is a key part of that. Uh, setting policy is a key part of that. Our role as board members is to make sure that the hospital has the resources it needs, to make sure that we're managing the budget of the hospital, we're responsible for the credentialing of the clinicians, we are also responsible for hiring and overseeing the CEO. We are representative of the community. We are here to make sure that we are listening to them. And I can say, without fear of contradiction from any of my fellow board members, it's a tremendous amount of work. 
I had no idea. <laughs> I left a full-time job where I paid <laughs> for an almost full-time job where I do not. Strategy. We are also responsible for setting the strategy of the hospital going forward, thinking about the future, and working with the CEO to envision that. We have been very fortunate to have had Dave Robertson as our CEO. He's been a strong leader and well-loved by the staff and hugely respected, as have our past CEOs, including Dr. Hohat. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to go back over all the things that were just said about the role of the uh, board relative to running the hospital. Um, I'd like to believe, despite what Tim said, that in the four years that I was at the hospital, that we made tremendous progress. I came in at a very chaotic time. Um, and the board and I had to develop new relationships because the board, for good reason, had stepped in to run the hospital with my predecessor. And so we had to set some new rules. And it wasn't easy. It took time. Um, but I think we made some real progress. And again, they had to step in when they had a problem a short while ago. That's the board's backup. But the biggest thing that hasn't been mentioned, the board's responsibility is the quality of care that is delivered to the patients of this community. They are responsible to assure, and this comes from the JCH, they're, they're responsible for the services, the quality of the services that are delivered to the people of the community. And that's a job that apparently they've done very well because we do have a quality hospital. Are there gaps in care? Absolutely. I'm running to the board because, not because we have a problem hospital, not because I feel bad about what's been going on. I'm running the board because I know something about the gaps in care, and I know something about running the hospital, and I think I can be an asset. Okay, it's time for summary comments. And we'll start with Evan. Oh, I'd like to start by saying I think I have the temperament to be a good trustee and the expertise. Uh, I have a positive attitude. I'm not a flamethrower. I'm not trying to take things down. I've been a builder all my career. I've built companies from the ground up. I've been involved with many not-for-profits for 20 plus years and a lot of success. And I've already shown, just in the nine months I've been involved, working with Catherine, that we've been able to you know, run a good process, bringing in a new CEO. Uh, my aspiration is that, uh, as a trustee looking forward, we'll engage in a thorough strategic planning process. Where we'll engage the input from the community. I don't think a needs assessment from three years ago is good enough. I think we need to start from take that, start from scratch, and reach out, and engage the community. And we need to support the new CEO, because the prosperity of the hospital and the quality of care is going to be integrally linked to the success of our new CEO. I have three priorities. One of them is quality of care. The second one is supporting our leadership. And the third one is workforce and housing, and assuring that we have a team dedicated to uh, really providing great care here in the Valley and a financially stable institution. Thank you. So what I love about working in the ER is that it's a place where you take care of the entire community. 24-7, um, it's a place where you meet, learn from, and care for people from all walks of life with all kinds of different needs and problems. Um, it's 100% teamwork and what you really do matters. The same is true for St. John's Hospital. They have the, all those things apply. Um, I currently have the energy and the desire to continue to make a difference in such an environment as a trustee. 
by all measures, and there's just no question that St. John's is an extraordinary hospital in an extraordinary place. We all, and all of you as well, have the same goal. We want to keep to work to keep it that way and to make it our independent hospital. I hope citizens will vote for people who are team players with knowledge and experience to help make a difference. I believe I can make a difference and I value the chance to do so. Well, I've been here 40 years, and uh, and I've been through 26 CEOs, or 27 if you count Pam Naples twice. So uh, uh, I've seen a lot of things happen over the last 40 years with a lot of different CEOs. Uh, I think that there are major gaps we have in healthcare in this county that need to be addressed, and I think that the that I uh, will add a lot to this board by pointing out those gaps and being a lot more critical and not glossing over a lot of things that have been glossed over the past few years. Uh, I think it's important uh, for us to address the problems and be open and honest about the problems we've had and uh, to really get those corrected. And I appreciate your support. On, on the hospital. These things have been brewing for a long time. Um, and they know that. And they have not been sufficiently proactive in anticipating what the problems are going to be and how to solve them as they go along. And, and I think that, th that this almost panicked response to the housing, which, I mean, who in this community doesn't know and hasn't known for decades that we have a very serious housing issue. It's a mountain town. We had advance notice. There's housing issues all over the country now, but they started in the mountain towns, and nobody should be surprised about it. And resolving issues that have been underway for a long time um, are much more difficult to resolve. Thank you. I was appointed to the board in 2009 uh, following one of the rough patches in the hospital's history. Uh, four of the trustees had voted to can the then CEO. Three of the trustees resigned, and three of us were appointed to replace them. Uh, since that time, there have certainly been some rough patches, but there has been tremendous success. And I am running for the board to try to build on that trajectory. Uh, the hospital has improved its quality ratings to the point where we are one of the outstanding hospitals in the country, rated as such by outside independent agencies. Uh, the improvements in quality have similarly contributed to a radical transformation in our financial strength. Uh, and I, again, and running to try to continue to contribute to that trajectory. Do we have problems? Absolutely. We need financing, we need support, and um, I think I am committed to working to those ends. Thank you, and thank you again for organizing uh, this League of Women Voters. For more than 30 years, I have been enthusiastically, passionately involved in Teton County. And I believe that our new CEO deserves a stable, high-functioning, supportive board to help him transition to become the beloved and respected leader that we know he can be. My priorities on the board will be patient care, access to care, 
retaining retaining employees through housing. And I've already forgotten what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> I've enjoyed being a board member for the past nine months, and I look forward to having an opportunity to continue to do that. But if I am not elected, I will continue to be involved in the hospital, as we all are, and I will continue to be a volunteer and support the hospital in every way I can. Thank you to Lee for putting this on. Thank you to our reporters for the questions. Um, I believe that my successful experience in running the hospital and my past in healthcare puts me in a unique position, both with knowledge about the hospital and the community and understanding the gaps in care um, and my commitment to transparency to allow me to be a really strong board member. Um, I'm going to ask for your vote because I think I can do the job. I am your user patient for candidate. I don't have a medical degree and I don't have some of the background of some of the current board members. But I am officially formally trained in hospital management and I have worked in five different departments in three different hospitals in varying capacities through my life. I took a 40 year hi hiatus and I want to return. I love St. John's. St. John's has served my family and me very, very well for the past 40 years in many respects. And so I commit to ensuring that there's quality of health care. We're going to take very good care of the staff because without them there's nothing. And above all, something that nobody's talked about tonight, and that is truly the long-range future. We need to forecast what's going to happen. If we see the same kind of uh, demographic jump that we've seen in the past two years here, we are not prepared, and there is no plan in place that addresses any of that. I'm trained uh, by Stanford in project, uh, at Stanford in project management, decision analysis, and forecasting, and I can bring those skills to this. Again, I am your user patient candidate. A new, unique perspective. Please vote for me. All right. Thank you. That concludes the evening, and that was a very lively conversation. Awesome. Thank you.